Okay, so this is going to be the first in a series of videos on John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. Um, on Liberty is a uh, fairly short book for how influential it's been. So, like, here it is. All right. Not that long short book. Um, but it has at least as much influence now um, as John Locke, probably more. Um, and part of what I'll, what I'll explain in this video, um, a video that's going to cover the material in the introduction chapter, basically. Part of what I'll cover in this video is why that is, why it came to be so influential. Um, part of it has to do with when it was written. So um, the second treatise on government was written in the late 1600s. This was written in the mid 1800s, right? So 150 years roughly have uh, gone by and society has changed very much. Uh, the political situation in Europe um, and in sort of uh, European countries, uh, countries dominated by people of European descent, like the United States. Right? Um, the political situation in those countries has changed significantly. Uh, economics has changed, society has changed, politics has changed. And uh, this resulted in... Um, as Mill points out, a very different set of opponents to the cause of liberty. Um, now, both Republicans and liberals would have latched on to uh, liberty as the goal, right? So that's what unifies their position. They have different accounts of liberty, but they share a concern for liberty. Conservative political thought, as represented by Burke, does, in a sense, support liberty. It supports traditional rights, uh, traditional liberties. But what it doesn't support is sort of universal liberty, the way that liberalism and republicanism uh, do. Um, but by the time Mill comes around, basically all the, not quite all, but almost all the absolute monarchies are um, on their way out. Uh, it's very clear the direction that um, Western civilization is headed in. By the time John Stuart Mill is writing, the um, uh, monarchs of England have basically lost any real political power. Um, uh, queen Victoria is the queen of England at that point, and she doesn't have anything uh, more significant than sort of a symbolic role. Um, queen Victoria is a queen in much the same way that say Queen Elizabeth today is a queen. Um, uh, France has no queen or king. Um, France is a republic. Uh, the United States is one of the great powers um, in the world already. Um, uh, Spain has a monarch. Um, Germany doesn't exist as a country yet, but Prussia is the dominant state in what would go on to become Germany. They have a monarch. The Austro-Hungarian Empire has a monarch. The Russian Empire has a monarch. Um, Italy is not a country yet, um, but uh, it would go on to be a kind of constitutional monarchy. But even in those countries that had monarchs still, monarchs with real political power, um, it was true that they were fighting against um, powerful social and political movements to strip them of that power. Um, this book was written in, I just want to double check the year to make sure point I'm about to make is right. This book was written originally in 1859. Um, in 1848, there was a series of major revolutions uh, across Europe that um, didn't weren't really successful, but they did show that the absolute monarchies that had dominated Europe for you know centuries upon centuries were on their way out. Um, it would take World War I, which happened around uh, 50 years later, um, to really seal the deal. Um, but John Stuart Mill is writing in a time where the enemy of liberty is not feudalism. The enemy of liberty is not absolute monarchy, at least not in France and uh, the United Kingdom and the United States, which were... Pretty much everyone recognized the three sort of most economically progressive countries in the world. Um, Germany would briefly sort of catch up with those 
powers uh, before World War One, and then lose World War One, and then try to catch up again, and then lose World War Two, um, and would only join and then really surpass the United Kingdom and France as major economic powers after it had finally adopted um, what you might think of as uh, modern political and social views, right? Gotten rid of their monarchy, gotten rid of all the old feudal organizations. So, whereas Locke and Rousseau were arguing against absolute monarchy and they were arguing against um, a return to sort of the traditional feudal uh, systems. Mill doesn't have to worry about that, and he points that out in the introduction, uh, that for a long time the cause of liberty was just the cause of giving the people, as opposed to the king or the nobility, uh, political power. But that once that had been accomplished, then if you were going to be concerned with liberty, you faced a problem. And he points it out fairly early in the book, which is that Right. Once you have popular government, once you have rule by the people, um, uh, as both liberals of Locke's type and Rousseau's kind of republicanism, as both of them said you should have. For Rousseau, it's sort of the central element of his whole view, and for Locke, it's not. But Locke is still, you know, in favor of popular government. Um, he thinks the legislature should be supreme and the legislature should be elected by the people. Now, um, as comes out in the conflict between liberals and Republicans during, in particular, the French Revolution, liberals like Locke and Locke's followers were comfortable with excluding lots of people from having the vote from the suffrage, uh, in particular, excluding the poor, and Republicans weren't. But they both agreed that there should be popular government. And Mill is at no point going to argue against popular government. He's going to say, look, that's settled. The people are the source of all political authority. And um, uh, we should never go back to a situation where a minority of people exercise political power and the majority of people are, you know, uh, out. Sometimes people take the things that Mill says in that direction, but it's just a misunderstanding of Mill. But what Mill wants people to acknowledge is that the majority of people can be a problem and that in popular government, it's the majority that rules, right? You can sometimes, when reading Rousseau, get the idea that Rousseau thinks the people are always going to agree with each other. But Mill just points out, no, when the people rule, when you have popular government, what that means is the majority of people rule. And the majority of people aren't always going to have the best interests of everybody at heart. The majority of people will sometimes have the desire, maybe even the real interest, um, to uh, do things that harm a minority of the people. And so John Stuart Mill, while he is concerned with liberty, right? John Stuart Mill is a liberal. Um, John Stuart Mill is uh, very, very much a liberal and not really a Republican at all. John Locke is sort of a mixture of Republican and liberal views because liberalism hadn't really emerged as its own view with Locke. I mean, Locke's where it starts, so like Locke's not already aware of the potential differences. If you want somebody to contrast as a liberal with Rousseauian type republicanism, it's going to be John Stuart Mill more than Locke. Um, what Mill's going to say is we should um, keep popular government, but popular government can pose a threat to liberty just as much as monarchy or aristocracy can. And this book is going to be about what the limits on government authority, no matter who has power, should be. So Mill is not going to claim that we shouldn't have majority rule, right? Mill's in support of popular government, and he says all kinds of popular government, no matter what kind of popular government you have, is majority rule. Right? If you have some other system besides majority rule, you just don't have popular government anymore, and John Stuart Mill doesn't support that. When I say that some people misinterpret Mill, some people take Mill to support uh, things like the Electoral College in the United States. Mill would not have supported the Electoral College in the United States. Um, or rather, Mill in this book wouldn't. He's got a later book where he says some funky things that like people with college degrees should get more votes than people without college degrees. Uh, but nobody wants that. Not even people with college degrees 
I mean, maybe when they're really pissed off, they do. But um, uh, Mill is not an opponent of popular government. What he's going to argue for is that any kind of government, even a popular government, even a government elected by the people and responsible to the people, every kind of government should have limits placed on its authority. There should be some things that the government is never allowed to do, no matter right, um, where it gets its uh, claims to authority. So John Stuart Mill in On Liberty is expressing um, a rather, a, a more modern form of liberalism, and in some sense, a purer form of liberalism than John Locke. So John Stuart Mill is a liberal, but he's a liberal in two very different ways than Locke. And this is going to be important for his, uh, for understanding his view. For one thing, John Stuart Mill is a secular liberal, right? All right I shouldn't put that under liberal. I should make it its own thing. Um, John Stuart Mill is probably the first uh, person we've read who genuinely just doesn't believe in God. Um, he doesn't make a big deal out of it. Like he's not a militant atheist. It's not his purpose to try to convince people that God doesn't exist, but it's pretty clear that John Stuart Mill just doesn't believe in God. Um, and even if you could get him to believe in God, John Stuart Mill would uh, clearly had no patience for any organized religion that he was aware of. Um, contrast that with Locke. Right? God is right at the center of Locke's view. Uh, what's the foundation of natural rights? God, right? Um, God makes our natural rights true. God is where our natural rights get their authority. And um, uh, ultimately, that's the basis of everything. God's will, God's law. Well, John Stuart Mill doesn't really believe there is a God. If And if you could get him to believe there was a God, he wouldn't believe that anyone could tell you what God wanted. And so his version of liberalism can't rely on claims about what God wants. And so when he's defending rights to be left alone, which is what he's going to support, right? And that's really what makes him a liberal. This whole book is about rights that you have for not just the government, but other people to leave you alone. And I'll get to that uh, in a minute too, that uh, sort of extra strength to his rights that he has. But he's defending rights of non-interference, right? So I'll put that here. He's supporting rights to non-interference. Sorry for that noise that just came on in the background. The handwriting is terrible. But he is going to be giving a secular justification of those rights. So that's a significant difference between Mill and Locke. All right, the other distinguishing feature is related to Mill's secularism. And that is that he is a utilitarian. Now, utilitarian is kind of like socialism or Marxism, um, but not in the way that you might be thinking. It's like socialism and Marxism in that it's a word that lots and lots of people use without having any idea what it means. Um, nine times out of ten, if a politician uses the word socialism, they're using it incorrectly. Uh, something basically, sim the same thing goes for Marxism. And it often goes for utilitarianism. Utilitarianism um, is distinguished from socialism and Marxism uh, in that there are plenty of um, actually intelligent, knowledgeable people, so not professional politicians, um, who also misuse it. Um, it's a philosophical position that lots and lots of people outside of philosophy talk about, and they just have no clue what it is. Uh, and they just use it just willy-nilly. So um, I'm not going to uh, give you like any kind of in-depth lesson on what utilitarianism, utilitarianism is, but I want to tell you enough so that you can understand what Mill's up to, evaluate his arguments on the basis of the kind of evidence he thinks he needs to provide, uh, while also arming you against some of the misuses of utilitarianism, uh, of the term. So a utilitarian is someone who um, uh, believes that the common good um, is the only uh, standard, let's say, of morality. So Locke, 
thought that God's will was a standard of morality. Jean-Jacques Rousseau didn't really have anything to say about what the ultimate standard of morality was, what the ultimate basis of morality was. He kind of avoided that by not talking about the natural law very much. I mean, he would bring it up from time to time, but he never said what the basis of the authority of the natural law was. If you had pressed him, he probably would have said something along the lines of what Locke said. Um, Rousseau was nowhere near as religious uh, and, or as devout, devoutly religious as Locke, but he was still clearly um, uh, more religious than Mill, for example. Um, but when you're secular like Mill, when you either don't believe in God or you don't believe that we really know anything about God if God exists, um, then you're in the position of having to find some different basis for morality. And while not the only secular basis for morality that's been given, there have been others, um, uh, classical Greek uh, basis. Uh, classical Greek foundations for morality didn't involve God, for example. So if you go back to Plato and Aristotle, God doesn't play any role at all in uh, their moral views. Um, and they weren't utilitarians. Uh, but it is sort of the distinctively modern um, alternative to sort of religious ethics. Uh, utilitarians believe that when you're trying to figure out what's right and wrong, you need to make reference to what's good for everybody. And utilitarians in particular believe that what's good for everybody is what makes people happier. So the ultimate standard for morality is um, human happiness, sort of the aggregate of human happiness. You figure out what the effects of whatever you're considering doing, like passing a law, let's say. Let's say you're thinking about passing a law and you want to know whether it's the right thing to do. A utilitarian is going to say, well, what you need to do here is figure out what the effects of passing this law will be. And then you need to figure out what those effects will mean for human happiness, right? How much pain and suffering will it cause people? Uh, on the other hand, how much pleasure and enjoyment will it cause people? Right? Um, you also have to take into account how many people will exist as a result of the law. Um, uh, so that can, uh, that can come up in all sorts of ways where the laws you have will determine you know, how many people will exist in future generations, how many lives will be saved, stuff like that. Um, but that's the way you go about it, right? Individual people can be happy or unhappy. They can live longer or shorter lives. Um, and what you need to do is figure out the effects of whatever it is you're contemplating doing on the individual happiness of all the people together. And everybody counts equally. And what you do is you sort of add up all the happiness that will result from what you do. You subtract from that all the unhappiness that will result from what you do. And then you've got the sort of net impact on happiness from your action. And then you just ask yourself, is this the action that I, if I take this action, will this have the best consequences on human happiness? And if the answer is yes, like if nothing else you can do would make people as a whole happier, then you do it. But if there is some alternative that would make people happier or better off, well, then you do that thing instead. So you should always do what will have the best net effect on total human happiness. Okay, so that's utilitarianism. So if we're going to have rights, if there are going to be things that the government ought never to do, then um, if Mills are going to defend those kind of rights, Mill's going to have to justify them by appeal to the effect of having those rights on human happiness. So what Mill's going to say is these rights to non-interference that he's arguing for will, sort of in the long run, make everybody happier than they would be if we violated those rights. All right. um, and so this is another way in which Mill is sometimes misinterpreted. So for one thing, Mill um, never argues against majority rule in this book. For another, uh, it is sometimes said that how people feel about what you do doesn't matter. Right? Um, uh, when justifying, you know, whether or not they can tell you to stop. So to give an example uh, that would have appealed to Mill in particular, suppose you have some non-standard religious belief and uh, as a result, the people in your community want you to stop um, practicing your religion because it's not standard. They are all part of the majority religion. You're part of a minority religion. 
Well, some people will say things like, well, it doesn't matter how they feel about it. Right? It doesn't matter whether uh, it bothers them that you have, um, that you're practicing this non-standard religious or religion or something like that. And some people attribute that to Mill, but that just can't be Mill's position, right? If it makes people unhappy that you're doing the thing you're doing, that matters. Right? Um, if you having some sort of uh, atypical, non-standard lifestyle offends and upsets other people, well, that matters when it comes to the common good, when it comes to total human happiness. So what Mill's going to have to do is say that the rights to non-interference, which he's going to argue for, those rights which say that even if you practice an unpopular religion, other people can't um, hurt you for doing that. They can't pressure you into stopping. He's going to have to say that protecting your right to live as you choose, to worship as you choose in this case, is going to create more happiness sort of in total in the long run than would be produced if everyone, who living, around, everyone living around you got their way and stopped you from doing the thing that you're doing that's upsetting them, right? Um, so let's say that you have a religion that uh, says that you have to eat, I'll just make something up here, you have to eat uh, raw meat in public, you know, once a week. And so once a week, people walk by your house and they see you eating raw meat, like a raw horse heart or something like, like they do in Game of Thrones. Um, sure, that might be something that upsets them, that they know you're doing that. And even if you do it inside your own house, if they know you're doing it, it might upset them. Right? It's like, I can't believe that monster is eating a raw horse heart because it's a Saturday or something like that. What Mill's going to have to argue for, and what he is going to argue for, is that leaving you alone to do that, allowing you to live your life as you see fit, um, in a case like that, is that general policy of leaving people alone to live their lives as they see fit is going to produce more happiness than would be produced if everyone found out that you had been forced to stop eating the raw horse heart. Right? It's not the case, though, that the happiness other people feel doesn't matter. Right? It's not the case that the happiness your community would feel if you would just stop doing this thing. It doesn't matter. Mill's going to say it matters, but it's outweighed. Right? Um, and the reason why I stress that is um, Mill is not a kind of absolutist, even though he might sometimes sound like it, about these issues. Right? Um, he can't be an absolutist because utilitarianism is just not friendly to absolutism. Absolutism is absolutism is the view that there are some things that are it is always 100% wrong to do no matter the circumstances. Right? Um, simple moral rules that you should follow no matter what happens. And utilitarianism is just incompatible with absolutism. Uh, the only thing utilitarianism says you should do in all circumstances no matter what is promote the general welfare or the common good. Right? Um, and so Mill can't be the kind of absolutist that he sometimes sounds like he wants to be in this book or that people sometimes say he is. So we're getting a secular utilitarian justification of liberal rights of non-interference in this book. And we're getting them not just against the government. So I've already mentioned this a little bit. Um, but Mill's argument in this book is not primarily devoted to restrictions on uh, the government, in part because he knows that most people are already with him on that, right? So it's 1859. Uh, at this point, you know, the United States has uh, the Bill of Rights. Um, there is a body of uh, common law precedent in the United Kingdom, which doesn't go as far as uh, the Bill of Rights in protecting people from the government, right? So while there's um, more robust freedom of speech protections in the United States in the 1850s than there are in the United Kingdom, there's still some protections in the United Kingdom, right? Mill doesn't think he's going to have to argue very hard in order to convince people that the government ought to leave people alone. Right? Um, he's going to argue that. And there are some people who will deny it. There are some people at his time, just as there are now, who will argue that the government gets to step in and tell people how to live their lives, tell them what to think, tell them what they can say in public. 
But he thinks what he's going to have to spend a whole lot more time arguing for is the idea that private citizens have to respect these rights of non-interference. So I'll give you an example. Right? Um, and it's, uh, it's my attempt to be a very timely example. So um, let's say that you accept the view that the government ought not um, say uh, pass a law that prevents transgender individuals from um, uh, practicing, you know, living their life the way they want to right, publicly. Most people are going to agree with that. But then consider the following. Consider a situation where everybody agrees that the government ought not do that. The government ought to uh, respect a right of non-interference on transgender uh, when it comes to transgendered individuals, allowing them to live their lives as they see fit, um, wear what they want to wear, um, identify themselves, you know, with like pronouns and things like that, the way they want to identify themselves, um, things like that. Um, use public facilities um, in the way that, uh, in accordance with the way they've chosen to live their lives. All those things. Let's say you accept all that. But let's say you then also say, um, that's fine for the government, but I, as a private individual, can put all kinds of pressure on these people, right? So let's say there's one transgendered individual living in a tiny little town of like a thousand people, and they're trying to live their life, and you acknowledge, right, well, the government shouldn't do anything to interfere with them. But I can, and I can get together with my friends and exclude them basically from all of social life, right? Um, tell them they're not welcome at church, right? Tell them they're not welcome at community events. Um, uh, command my, your children to not you know, talk to them or interact with them. Um, not you know, allow them to um, uh, make use of your business, like if you're a small business person, right? Not let them come in and buy from your store or something like that. You get together with everybody in the community and you do that. Well, what Mill's going to point out is that's just as an effective, that's just as effective a way of interfering with this person's life as would be state interference, right? Because you need other people. You need society to live a good life. You need society to be happy in the exact same way that you need not to be locked in a tiny box in jail, right, to be happy. And so the fact that the government can threaten you with jail, but everyone around you can threaten you with social exclusion, it's not like one of these threats is minor. And so Mill's going to be saying, not only should the government be um, barred by, say, constitutional limitations, from interfering with pe how people choose to live their lives. In addition, other people should um, refrain from exerting the kind of social pressure that we can all exert in order to change the way that people live their lives, to change the way that people behave. Um, it's not just a right against the government. It's a right that everyone has against the rest of society. Um, um, a, another timely example, sort of in, in some sense politically on the other side from the example I've just given, is everyone admits, or let's say everyone admits, that the government shouldn't stop people from um, uh, saying racist things, right? Uh, if you believe in freedom of speech, right, then you believe that someone can sort of, you know, in their own private life, believe racist things and say racist things. Right? Most people accept that the government shouldn't um, get in there and, and do stuff about that. Now, that's a little bit different than some kinds of um, incitements to violence, right? Uh, there are plenty of people who think that uh, we can regulate speech. In fact, it's, this is the dominant view right? in um, uh, American constitutional history, that when you're inciting people to commit crimes, and if it's known that certain kinds of language contributes to inciting people to commit crimes or certain kinds of speech in certain situations incites people to actually commit crimes, well, you can regulate that, right? So it's not like all racist speech is, is free in that way. Um, but I don't think most of us want, you know, the government sending around people listening in to the things that are said at like horseshoe throwing contests, which if you've ever been to a horseshoe throwing contest, some racist stuff that gets said at least in my experience. Um, but then what about 
social exclusion of people who practice racist speech or engage in racist speech. Um, a lot of times you'll find people defending that kind of social exclusion or what sometimes gets called canceling by appeal to the fact that um, it's not the government doing it. Right? It's not the government hurting anyone. It's all of us getting together and expressing our um, uh, moral condemnation of their behavior. Well, while I'm not saying that Mill would necessarily be against that, right, would not be against, you know, you're doing the same kinds of things, right? You could imagine you're in what might be an atypical situation, but you're in like a, a tiny town which has only one racist in it, right? But they're like a really loud racist. So the rest of you get together and you exclude them from society. You exclude them from community events. You refuse to serve them, right, at your um, uh uh, privately owned in your privately owned businesses. Um, just the fact that it's not the government doing it, just the fact that it is uh, you as a private individual, right, just organizing with other private individuals to socially ostracize people, that doesn't mean it's necessarily okay. Now, you might think, well, these two situations I'm talking about, um, the one where there's, you know, a transgender individual and a racist individual, you might think there's important differences between these and that we shouldn't treat these two cases as the same. Maybe so. But it, what is not going to decide the issue, Mill thinks, is that it's private individuals. Right? Mill is against the idea that what you might think of as freedom of speech or freedom of religion or freedom of conscience rights only restrict the government. He thinks, no, they restrict all of us. Um, it is wrong to apply concerted social pressure on people to change the way they live their lives when you're only doing that, um, in a sense, for their own good. Right? Mill is going to have a principle that he uses to decide how to deal with different cases. And it's going to be the harm principle. Um, basically, what he says is, if somebody's behavior isn't harming anyone else, then it is wrong to um, uh, exert social pressure to make them change the behavior. Right Now, you might think, well, here's the difference between the racist case and the transgender case. Racist people are hurting others. But you're going to have to make the case that it's the racist speech or the racist beliefs that's hurting them. Because everyone agrees, right? If you're going around burning crosses on a lawn, right, well, that's, uh, you know, causing harm. That's like a, a threat to commit violence and threats to commit violence or assault, right? Uh, if you go up to someone and say, I'm going to beat the hell out of you, that's illegal. You don't get to say that, right? Um, but what if it's just, you know, some asshole in a cabin, you know, who like writes little racist, uh, like draws little racist posters or something like that and puts it on the fence around his cabin so that everyone sees it, but he's not um, proactively going out and threatening people. Um, then, are we going to say that he's harming people? What Mill says is you have to make the case that he is if you want to apply that social pressure or if you want the government to get involved. In fact, he's going to say the same rules apply for the government as do for private individuals contemplating exerting social pressure on people to change their views or to change the way they live their lives. So that's the project of this book. Um, the next chapter uh, is going to deal with specifically liberty of conscience, liberty of thought. Um, and uh, despite the fact that he spends, um, it's the longest chapter in the book, despite the fact that he spends so much time on it, um, it is not something that goes right to the heart of his view. It's sort of a special case, a special application of his view. But it is important to understand um, because he goes into the most detail when it comes to um, this kind of case. So that'll be on the next video.